The old house has been abandoned for going on two decades. And as with any place that's been left uninhabited for this long, rumors tend to spiral. Of course, there are the more mundane explanations for why the two-story, four-bedroom home on the end of a nice street lays in semi-ruin. Black mold, asbestos, rising house prices. But those weren't the stories that most people told. Everyone in the neighborhood knew what really happened. All those years ago, the family that lived there had been murdered, and their killer was never caught. The three young paranormal investigators, with EMF readers in their hands and GoPro cameras mounted on their hard hats, know all about this. They approach the house in the dead of night, mumbling commentary for the recordings. If the old house really is as haunted as everyone says it is, then they could be in for something really good here. Their subscribers always loved brand new paranormal content. They use a crowbar to breach the front door and head inside. It's everything you can expect from a house that had been abandoned for 17 years. Dust, cobwebs, and graffiti abound, broken bottles scattered across the floor. Someone has scrawled, Welcome to Hell, above the door in faded sharpie. It all plays perfectly for the cameras. Paranormal content gold. All of them turn on their flashlights, generously provided to them by one of their sponsors, of course. But in this particular situation, they have no idea just how valuable their product really is. After all, there are some frightening things that hide in the dark. The leader of the trio begins ascending the stairs, narrating into his helmet cam, giving the more popular version of the house's legend. The perfect suburban family, torn apart, literally, by a killer hiding in their home. The family had all been brutally murdered by someone in their home, but the police never found any sign of unlawful entrance or exit. There were no clues to the killer's presence whatsoever, in fact. It was as if they were a ghost, a vapor. It was almost as though whoever killed the family had always been in that house, and even after the murders were committed, they never left the place either. As he tells the story, the lead investigator starts to feel a little nervous. Even though he himself doesn't really believe in the supernatural, he just plays up reactions for the views, he still can't help but wonder, should I really be here? Am I making a terrible mistake? Is there a chance that whatever did this all those years ago could still be in the house, waiting for me? But he pushes those thoughts from his mind. This gig is too valuable for him to wimp out now. And really, what are the chances that something actually dangerous would be lurking in the house? The other two investigators are still looking around downstairs, sticking together, their flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. Their boss always insists on going upstairs first. He demands the glory shot, after all. That leaves the rest of them searching the downstairs living room, dining room, and kitchen, where the best they can hope for is maybe a particularly haunted-looking dishwasher. It's why the younger of the two is so surprised huh? when they suddenly feel something happening to their body that they've never experienced before. In an instant, their whole body convulses with an involuntary shudder. They feel the temperature drop, and the world gets just that little bit darker. The best way they can describe the feeling is impending doom. Like any moment now, something terrible is going to happen. But almost as soon as the feeling begins, it's gone. Intensity dropping, the dread starting to dissipate, as though whoever or whatever caused this feeling literally passed right through them. Their fellow investigator asks them if they're okay. Of course, they nod and force a smile. They're fine. It's just a spooky place is all. Atmosphere like this would get to anyone. Meanwhile, the lead investigator is exactly where he wants to be ascending a rickety stepladder up into the attic, the very same attic where, all those years ago, the police had found what was left of the family. And from everything he'd read on the subject, their remains weren't a pretty sight, even by true crime enthusiast standards. He enters the attic and shines his flashlight around, capturing all the dusty old boxes left to rot in the cold. He's engrossed in the macabre spectacle of what had once been the worst and final moments of a group of strangers' very real lives. The attic is full of spider webs and shadows. They're so ubiquitous that as the lead investigator pauses to tell his camera the next chapter of the grisly tale, he doesn't even notice one of the shadows peeling off of the wall behind him. It wafts silently towards him, like a gust of midnight air. Little by little, the blob of shadow starts to take on a vaguely human shape. It leans forward in the investigator's direction, arms extended like a classic movie monster, Long, dark claws slide out of its shadowy hands. Downstairs, the other two investigators hear the most terrible scream. For a moment, the more fantastical thought crosses their minds. Could this be one of the tormented souls of the departed family, longing to be heard after years of silence? 
Then it occurs to them that they recognize the scream. It belongs to their boss. The two of them charge up the stairs, flashlights in hand, as the screaming starts to become more desperate than pained, like that of a wounded animal with its leg caught in a trap. Those terrible wails are echoing down from the open hatch leading into the attic. It's so dark up there, something must have broken his flashlight. That's when they notice something else. Red, dripping from the open hatch. For a moment, they hesitate, wondering what could be going on up there. Could they really help, or would they just be running into the danger themselves? But soon, their desire to save their boss's life overpowers their fear. They grab the ladder and start climbing, feeling the dripping blood on the worn wooden rungs. When they finally get up into the attic, it feels like the scream is coming from everywhere, bouncing off the walls in a terrible, echoing cacophony of pain. They turn in all directions, hovering their flashlight beams around the room in wide, sweeping arcs, until both fall on the source of all this terror. And when they see it, they can't help but scream too. The lead investigator's body is floating about a foot off the ground, his screams now fading into pained gurgles. Something huge and dark is lifting him up with one hand and sinking the long, dark claws of its other into his neck. The second the twin flashlight beams concentrate on the creature, it drops the lead investigator's bleeding body down onto the ground. His skin slate gray, his feeble twitching slowing to a halt as the last of his life drains from him. Two glowing red pinpricks open up in the face of the dark figure, eyes like terrible, burning coals etching themselves into their memory. Like smoke, it continues to glide backwards further, seeking refuge in the dark, a safe haven amongst the other shadows. By this point, the two surviving investigators know there's nothing they can do for their boss anymore. All that's left is to get out and survive. They have to save themselves. They turn, wasting no time running towards the exit. They don't notice it, but the second they turn the beams of their flashlights away, the shadow's terrible eyes disappear and it starts advancing towards them again, its claws outstretched and grasping for them with awful fury. The shadow creature grabs at their heads as they make their final leap for the exit. However, all the monster can pull away are their helmets and helmet cams as they scramble down the ladder and then down the stairs, running at speeds they didn't even think possible as the shadow slithers down behind them. It doesn't give up. It wants their lives. It wants their warm human blood on its claws. They clear the threshold of the accursed house and keep running to their car. One looks over their shoulder and sees the shadow leave the house, gaining on them, both claws outstretched and ready to rend their flesh. The two climb into their car. They see the shadow coming towards their window. It's moving so quickly, only a few feet away now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Ignition. The car starts up and the driver smashes the pedal down. They take off, quickly accelerating up to illegal speeds as the shadow continues to chase, slowly getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A distant nightmare. A terrible, dark ghost. As it finally disappears, they feel a moment of safety. But really, only a moment. Because it occurs to them then that they cannot say, with any confidence, that this monster won't just be waiting for them when they get home. SCP-280, also known as Eyes in the Dark, is one of the more frightening and dangerous anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Of course, it likely won't be causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon, but if you happen to run into this nocturnal monster, it's likely to cause an end-of-you scenario and remove you from the world with extreme prejudice. There's no way of telling just how many lives it claimed before the SCP Foundation finally got it into containment, and perhaps it's best to just not think about that. SCP-280 is a black, wraith-like apparition that floats at roughly average human height, with no visible legs or feet, as the lower portion of its body simply fades away before it reaches the ground. In its dormant state, the entity may appear to be little more than a shadow, easily dismissed, especially in dark environments. This comes as a natural result of the being's frightening ability to become intangible at will, and only become physical when it enters a state of active aggression toward a human target. In this intangible state, victims have even been known to walk through the shadowy mass by accident. While this doesn't lead to any detrimental physical effects, victims report that being inside the creature can lead to heightened states of anxiety, fear, and dread. Despite its body being wholly composed of an unidentifiable black matter, when exposed to light, the creature does begin to express a pair of glowing dots on its head similar to eyes, hence its frightening nickname. However, all tests indicate that these eyes aren't actually functional. Instead, they appear to be a kind of defensive measure, like false eyes on the carapace of an insect. 
These eyes are never shown when SCP-280 is advancing towards a victim, only when it is in retreat, though this is only one of the entity's several defensive responses. If an area where the creature is residing becomes fully illuminated, or a sudden flash of extremely bright light is directed against it, then it will immediately dematerialize and appear in a different area. The one positive thing that can be said about the hunting patterns of SCP-280 is that they're relatively predictable. The entity, it seems, only has an interest in human beings. When it selects a target, it will pursue them relentlessly, approaching in its intangible form with its arms extended in what many describe as a sleepwalker pose. In this state, you may finally notice 280's claws, long, thin, and razor sharp. It may silently approach while the victim is turned the other way, or while they sleep soundly in bed, or even when they're paralyzed in fear at the very sight of it. When SCP-280 closes the distance, it will begin to rip and tear at its victims with its claws, causing massive physical trauma and, in some cases, death. Attacks range from one to five minutes of being relentlessly clawed at by the beast. When the attack is over, it will simply expose its eyes, become intangible once more, and escape. You will not be able to overpower the creature. Foundation tests have shown that it has extreme physical strength, and it's capable of tearing apart solid steel with little effort. If it can't find any humans to victimize, then it will simply remain dormant, pressing itself up against a wall, in a dark corner, or within some other structure. Which is why, if ever you feel nervous about a certain dark corner in a room near you, it is best to remove yourself from the situation as quickly as possible and remain in a brightly lit area. It would perhaps be comforting to believe that SCP-280 is acting on some twisted form of animal instinct. After all, while the results may seem horrific to us, every organism has to eat, right? Well, sadly, that isn't the case here. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, sleep, or breathe to survive, and it never consumes any of the matter torn from its victims. The best working theory is that the entity simply enjoys the harm it causes, taking a degree of perverse pleasure in hunting down and murdering its targets. There is no better nature to appeal to here. The SCP Foundation's ability to study the creature's biology has also been stunted, in part due to the creature's highly aggressive nature, and also the fact that its selective intangibility makes gaining physical samples almost impossible. Even capturing and containing the creature in the first place came partially out of blind luck. It first came to Foundation attention after a series of mysterious locked door murders in a small Mississippi township. In the most recent case, an entire family had been brutally murdered in their home, leaving only one survivor. A traumatized nine-year-old boy named David who'd locked himself in the basement when he started to hear the screaming. He was so terrified by the things he saw that night that he remained in a catatonic state for weeks afterwards, completely unresponsive to outside stimulus. But one little detail saved his life. A flashlight was clasped in his white knuckle grip, shining a bright beam of cold, white light onwards. When David was removed and placed into medical care, officers began searching the building for any kind of clues as to how the other four family members were murdered. However, during this investigation, the police were just as vulnerable as the victims who'd been so recently slain. While one officer was wandering around the attic, looking for any evidence they may have missed, SCP-280 emerged from the darkness and attacked tearing into his body with its long, deadly claws. Luckily for the officer in question, he survived the incident, though he was badly wounded. His report on the matter, including the ardent claim that he was attacked by a being, quote, made from black smoke, caught the attention of SCP Foundation operatives embedded in the precinct. They soon took over the investigation and descended on the house, hoping to tag and bag whatever had been behind all these deaths. This would be easier said than done. While Foundation field agents canvassed the home, they simply walked past the creature multiple times, discounting it as a mere shadow. After all, it only had these easily identifiable glowing eyes when it was in a retreating position. Even when it entered its physical state, operatives brushing up against it generally dismissed the sensation as hair, clothing, or some other object touching them in the dark. This already bungled investigation got even worse when the Foundation decided to introduce high-intensity lights into the equation, hopefully flushing the creature out. This, of course, only caused it to dematerialize and appear elsewhere. The chase ended in an almost farcical fashion, a cavalcade of Foundation agents chasing a cloud of sneering black smoke across a Mississippi field at 2.30 a.m. Thankfully for the human race, the entity was, at the very least, eventually secured and contained. However, this wouldn't be the last time it was out of containment. During a series of tests with different types of illumination, intending to test SCP-280's reflexes, it disappeared from its chamber. 
it seemed almost to sink through the different levels of the illuminated site before coming to rest at the containment chamber holding SCP-1591. This made for a fascinating accidental cross-test. You see, SCP-1591, to put it simply, is a unique sculpture of a star that emits an incredibly bright light, and this light will slowly make any being subject to its glow intangible before disappearing completely. When SCP-280 came before SCP-1591, it displayed its eyes but did not retreat. In fact, it assumed a kneeling position and simply remained before the anomalous sculpture until it faded from existence. It then remanifested in its own containment chamber several hours later without incident. All things considered, it went pretty well as far as containment breaches involving deadly, human-hating monsters go. Because of its ability to demanifest and phase through solid objects, SCP-280 is incredibly difficult to contain, earning it the dreaded Keter object class. In order to avoid the risk of demanifestation, SCP-280 is contained in a 5 by 5 meter cell that is perpetually left in a state of total darkness. No equipment is to be left in the cell unsupervised at any time, and any items brought into the cell for testing must be removed when the testing is complete. Any staff members entering the chamber for tests must be equipped with infrared goggles, an infrared ID strobe, and also a strong flashlight to ward the creature off in the case that it becomes aggressive. If SCP-280 does attempt to attack anyone in the chamber, all attending staff are instructed to turn on their flashlights and turn the beams against the creature. No aggressive action is permitted, and staff members must remain at least one meter away from SCP-280 at all times for their own safety. And if you suddenly feel yourself getting a little nervous in an eerily dark room, I'd like you to remember this. The one thing more frightening than seeing eyes in the dark is not seeing them. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-015-IT, The Boogeyman, for another terrifying anomaly that you may encounter lurking in the dark. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.